Hi, Jeff Spira here. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story of two voyages that were scheduled to occur but never really did occur. Uh, a major event in history kind of changed all that. Um, anyway, I'm going to tell a couple of longer stories that are going to go back into, into history a bit and so you can understand you know, how some of these things came together and, uh, and resulted in this all happening. My um, grandfather was a U.S. citizen. He was born in Montreal, Canada in 1885. Uh, his father, his name Samuel Spira, uh, was my great-grandfather. And he was a U.S. citizen as well, but he was an immigrant from Vienna, Austria. Um, anyway, he took his wife and newborn son, who was, who was born in, in Montreal, uh, back to Austria to uh, raise his family and, and and he had two more kids after he got back there and all that, and, you know, teach his kill children and all that. So, um, so anyway, uh, he and the family, after he, my, my grandfather had kind of grown and been educated all that, um, they came back to the U.S. and, you know, uh, before World War I, because my grandfather was, uh, um, had some, a little bit of history in World War I. It, never really joined, but he, uh, he, he tried to join uh, the U.S. Uh, Army back then, but um, uh, in any event, uh, he was here in 1910, say, or something like that, um, maybe earlier, maybe, maybe 1905, something like that. Um, now, my grandmother uh, was named Marsha Leszczynski, and she was born outside Warsaw, Poland in 1895. Her father was my, my other great-grandfather, or one of my other great-grandfathers, was named Joseph Leszczynski. He was a lawyer and a politician, and, um, and he apparently was pretty vocal and pretty, uh, you know, um, had a lot of political connections and that sort of thing. And uh, One day when she was a girl, uh, she says a schoolgirl, I, I suspect early teens, um, the secret police broke into their house in the middle of the night and grabbed him and hauled him away. And uh, they never really saw him again. Um, about a year later, her mother took her and her three siblings, two, two boys and two girls, um, and moved to the U.S. Now, she suspected, she never knew really, but she suspected that, um, that perhaps her father had... Uh, had died in prison or been tortured and killed or something. They, she, she really didn't know. So, um, Anyway, uh, my grandmother and grandfather both lived in New York and they married in, 19, in the early 1920s. Uh, my father was born in uh, 1926. And in the Jewish tradition, my father was named for the deceased relatives. So he was, became Joseph Samuel Spira, or his, his two grandfathers' first names. So. Spire is a bit unusual. It's a it's a rabbinical name from Austria, but it's kind of related to Shapiro, which is a little more common Ashkenazi Jewish name, um, which is the European version of, of Jewish people that uh, you know that uh, that immigrated mostly to the United States, so um, or or Israel after the war, you know, after World War II, so. World War II started in December 1941 with the U.S. bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th. Uh, the, the, actually, the Japanese think of it as December 8th because um, it was actually the 8th in, in Japan then because they're on the other side of the international date line. So, um, anyway, at that time my father was in high school. Uh, he graduated in 1943. At age 16, he had skipped a year or maybe two when he was younger. Um, and at that time, the draft was taking everyone who turned on their 18th birthday, basically, because it was mid wartime, World War II. And, and most of the people that he knew, um, and uh, he, had, he actually had a half brother who my grandfather was married before he met, he married my grandmother. Uh, who who he met once and was killed in uh, in Italy. So uh, during the, Italy, the, the you know the World War II conflict there. So um, and he was he was very concerned about you know 
going to Europe, and his parents certainly were, because the Jewish community knew at that time about the the issues with uh, the Holocaust and Hitler and all that. So, um, so at age 17, my father decided to, uh, and with encouragement of his parents, uh, of course, uh, decided to join the Navy because there's a pretty good chance that he wouldn't end up being a POW in, in Europe and have to deal with the, you know, that whole thing. He, he, he looks very Jewish as well as, <laughs> as having a Jewish last name. So, um, anyway, um, so in 1944, he became a Navy sailor, at the, signed up at the Brooklyn Naval Yard. And they ended up, and after his basic training, they made him a CB, which is, was the construction battalion. Now, if you're familiar, the, the CBs were, um, uh, they, they were, they had to, they had to uh, go into battle areas and do construction. They built airfields and, and uh, you know, uh, artillery, uh, um, you know, areas where they were protected and that sort of thing. So they were, they were the construction guys that, uh, that went in while the battles were still going on. They, they, were, they were lost a lot of people there and that sort of thing. So, um, but my father, like me, had uh, fairly poor vision and, um, and they, they told him when he joined that he would not go overseas. So they ended up sending him to uh, Alameda, California, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's a big naval base there. And he watched his other, other of his guys that he was stationed with there uh, got sent off to places like Guam and Iwo Jima and, and all that. So. So one day the uh, Navy said they took uh, all of those who were considered unfit for overseas duty and they had them stand on a line to get checked out with a doctor. And uh, my father said it took hours, but he finally got to the doctor and the doctor looked at him and said, how do you feel, son? And he said, okay, I guess. And uh, so the doctor took out a big red stamp and it said, okay for overseas service. And he stamped his paperwork. So. Um, all of a sudden now he could go overseas as well. And so um, in the spring of 1945, they put him on a ship and, uh, and sent him off to the Philippines. So, um, uh, but this was after MacArthur had already returned and, uh, and the Philippines were back in the Allies' hands. Now, um, you know, there were still some Japanese there. There was, there was uh, fighting still up in the mountains and and uh, that sort of thing, but uh, um, in some of the remote, more remote jungle areas and such. So, and of course, there were several uh, Japanese POW camps uh, in Manila where he was stationed. So um, they got to training, and they were they were training him, and a lot of their training was uh, doing beach landings in LSTs, which is a, a tank carrying landing craft. And of course, the Higgins boats, which were personnel carriers. That's like the type they used in uh, D-Day in 1944 in Europe. So, um, so he, he had been trained to, to get out and do beach landings and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, get equipment off and because they were the construction battalion. So they had to get tools and, and equipment and bulldozers and things like that off of the, uh, off of the training ships and onto the beaches. So. Um, so everyone kind of knew that they were being trained for the mainland invasion of Japan. They were, they were um, training in the Philippines, uh, and uh, at that time, um, Okinawa was, was underway, and, uh, and so, you know, it was near, it was near the, you know, summer of 1945. Uh, so um, so they were, everybody was closing in on the island of Japan, and there were um, estimates that that during the uh, main uh, Japan uh, invasion, uh, several million people would have been killed. Um, that would include citizens of Japan as well, because everyone was expected to fight. I mean, I've I've seen a lot of uh, uh, movies and things where they train even kindergartners to uh, to use spears and if and to repel the invaders. So. You know, everyone who could walk, uh, from from little kids to to uh, you know old timers, would uh, were prepared for this attack on on mainland Japan, and they they were ready. They had they had 
weapons, as crude as they were, they didn't have much in the way of firearms or anything, but they had, you know, whatever they had. And so it was going to be, everyone knew it was going to be a bloody battle. And that included my father and his group training there. So, Okay, well, now I, I was when um, I graduated from Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo in 1976. And I had... Uh, um, I had two job offers at the time. The first was with a Boeing as a fasteners engineer. I could just see myself wearing out the quarter inch circle template, you know, laying out rivets. This is before CAD, of course, so <laughs> laying out rivets in the tails of uh, giant airplanes, you know, quarter inch rivets here every two inches. You know, it, it, it kind of scared me that job, you know, that uh, that was one of the offers I had. But the other one was, and I, and I was had a lot of interest in it, was as a uh, as a hydraulics engineer to design uh, equipment for shipyards and offshore drilling rigs, and um, design and, and build and install that sort of thing. So um, this was out of Santa Barbara. It was actually out of Goleta, California, and it was um, um, the 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 interview went something like this you know the first thing they did they asked me is do you mind traveling i said no i don't mind and they said are you sure you don't mind traveling i said no I, I i'm happy to travel and they said you'll be gone a long time all over the world you know maybe six weeks or a couple months at a time and you'll be uh you know away from home is it are you sure that's okay with you that was essentially the thing. Well, I, you know, I was, everyone else in that company was old enough to be my father, really. They were in their 40s or something, and I was in my early 20s. And, um, you know, I was single and didn't didn't have a, didn't own a home or anything. You know, I rented, <laughs> I rented, you know, furnished apartments. You know? So, <laughs> so to me, that sounded great. I mean, tra you know, 23 years old, traveling the world on an expense account, you know, why not? You know, that was, uh, so uh, I, I loved that job and I took it and I, uh, I started uh, traveling around. I did a, a shipyard in, in uh, Korea, another one in, uh, um, in Italy, in, uh, you know, and uh, did offshore drilling rigs. I did the Denver Mile High Stadium that the Broncos played in. Um, uh, the, the part of it moved based uh, when they wanted to change from baseball to football. Um, and I did uh, a lot of drilling rig work and, uh, you know, shipyard work in Scotland and, and down in the, the Gulf Coast, you know, a lot in Houston, that sort of thing. So well, the biggest job I was uh, working on, though, is one that, uh, that just started about the same time I started with the company. It was the uh, largest uh, shiplift platform in the world, and it was in uh, Batangas Bay in the Philippines. So... Um, uh, it would it would lift a Panamax ship, and at that time, the biggest ship that would go through the Panama Canal was about 750 feet long, about 95 feet wide, 96 feet wide, I think, and uh, 25,000 long tons. So that's that's a good sized ship, and this platform would lift them completely out of the water um, to work on them. I mean, they would have to be empty, of course, and that, that sort of thing. But uh, um, and they did do maintenance on them because normally. Big ships like that are, are are handled in graving docks, which you know are uh, are really canals that they put up a wall on the one end and pump the water out. But the shiplift platform would actually be a steel platform. They lowered into the water and then jacked it up and then rolled a train under the ship uh, called a bogey train. And then we uh, you could roll the ship along railroad tracks, a bunch of railroad tracks to uh, to work on it in the yard. So. Anyway, um, so there's, these shiplift platforms use chains uh, that they gripped and released uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the jacks that we built, um, you know, used these chains. And the, the one in the Philippines had, uh, had 60 240-ton jacks, I think it was. Each one had, had two chains on it. So um, that, was, uh, that was, you know... <laughs> big big chains so and they had to be matched up so that the chains were um, matched to each other's too so they would you know maintain the balance and the levelness of, of the platform so um, so they sent me to Japan to uh, to buy these chains uh, and I went to Himeji Japan which is a, a kind of a small town on the inland sea coast it's in the, the prefecture of Hyogo which is um, 
prefecture is kind of like a state or, or a county. Um, if you were talking about a place like uh, you know England or or uh, Ireland, you know they're different counties. So prefectures are more like that. They're you know groups of land. Um, anyway, Himeji's in Hyogo Prefecture. So um, uh, right up the, uh, the the bay from them is the largest uh, um, port in that area, and you've probably heard of it, Kobe. Kobe, you know, there's a Kobe steel plant and all that, but that's a big uh, harbor there, and it's a big, uh, uh, you know, uh, near Himeji where where uh, this was made. So, um, so I um, I, I uh, went to Japan to inspect this chain and make sure that uh, the chain would meet the requirements and. Um, one of the requirements was that it uh, it be approved by the Lloyd's Registry of Shipping. Well, their um, their uh, shipping inspector, or no, I shouldn't say shipping inspector, their, their their inspector for chain and for you know various other steel items that are used with, on ships. Uh, his name was Kuroishi, and uh, you know a lot of the Japanese names are like like the. British names or European names during uh, during the medieval time that Japanese names were based on names of places you know like uh, oh I don't know like Takayama top of the mountain or my friend uh, in uh, that area is named Sunagawa which really means three rivers so you know the the, uh, the Japanese don't have um, didn't have family names until the Meiji Restoration so. And the only people that had family names were the samurai, and they were only about four percent of the population. But um, the rest of the uh, uh, people just had, you know, had to eventually come up with names. So there, most of their names are, are, are you know, natural uh, location sort of places. So anyway, um, you know, places in 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 Europe like Woodbridge or. You know, Hill or Vale or you know a lot of these names uh, in uh, England were were pl names of things. You know. Anyway, um, so the inspector's name was Kuroishi, Kuroishi-san. In in Japanese, Kuro means black, and and san, Ishi means rock or stone. You know. Um, so I called him Mr. Blackstone. Everybody thought that was funny, and <laughs> we got to be we got to be friends. We were there. We were working together for several weeks, and. And everybody thought that was funny that I, I took up the name Mr. Blackstone for him. So um, anyway, one day at uh, you know after lunch, I asked him, you know, what did you do during the war? You know, I was curious. You know, so in reference to World War II, and he told me that because um, he was a bit older, he was I guess he was 50ish or maybe 60ish. I don't know. And I you know this was in 1977. So um, anyway, he said that he had been. Um, stationed in Kobe and they were building military ships at the at the shipyard there so um, and then he started telling me that he was working on uh, a, a Kai-10 which uh, I didn't I had no idea what they were at the time uh, it, it kind of means turn of heaven something like that and so I, I you know I, I, I was kind of at a loss but he kind of explained uh, uh, it's basically a micro submarine that was made out of a standard torpedo. Um, there were different different styles made and all that, but it was manned, and uh, and it was really manned for a, as a suicide mission. Um, so when um, you know when you could put them in the water and pe they had guns on them and stuff, and they would they would shoot at ships and all that, and if uh, if uh, they if. You know, then they would ram the ship, or that ship, or another ship, depending on where it was. Um, and they, these were built and used in late in late '44 and early 1945. Some of them pretty effectively. Um, there's a number of known attacks that caused casualties, and one major ship, the USS Underhill, was a Buckley-class destroyer, and it was sunk in July 1945 by Kai-10. There's a Wikipedia page uh, describing Kaitan right below here. So, um, if you, I, I put a link down below in the in the description. So, so Kuroishi was um, uh, was assigned to be a Kaiten pilot or whatever you call him. I guess it was a guy driving the Kaiten, and they were lo he was planning to launch from shore when the American mainland attack came. Um, you know, so 
you know, it, it, that kind of took me by surprise, you know, and I talked to him, I told him about my father being trained in the Philippines at that time um, to attack, to be in as part of the attack. And I, and I just, I thought about that and uh, both of their voyages were, were scheduled to take place. And, you know, it's, there's a possibility that they may have even met back then, you know, 32 years before. So um, it's very likely that neither would have su survived those voyages had they met or not. So, um, so it occurred to me that I wouldn't even be there talking to him uh, if those voyages had occurred. So. so the next words out of my mouth were is that the atom bomb stopped these voyages, you know. And the only reason that Kuroishi son and my father um, survived, you know. August 6, 1945, the uh, atom bomb was dropped in Hiroshima, and August 9th it was dropped in Nagasaki. And uh, that brought the end of the war, so. Um, but this was the first, my first trip to Japan, and really the first time I'd ever spoken to anyone in Japan um, that, you know, about this topic. <laughs> it, didn't, it never occurred to me, you know, to bring it up before. Um, and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know what to expect. I, I, I kind of blurted it out without thinking, but uh, Kuroishi uh, agreed with me and said that, that uh, saying the only reason he was still alive was because the bombs went off and the war ended. So, um, anyway, so that's the story of two voyages in 1945 that never happened. So, anyway, the best way to keep these stories coming is to subscribe, like, share, and comment below if you'd like to bring anything up about it. I'd love to hear about it. Anyway, thank you all for watching.